For this special Christmas episode of the Real Talks with So Sad Ireland Wellbeing series, we were joined by Stephen Lynch. Earlier in 2023, Stephen raised an incredible €70,000 for So Sad Ireland and Mental Health Ireland by running the length of the country. It was a gruelling challenge of 563 kilometres full of highs and lows that tested him physically, mentally and emotionally. I hope you find this conversation as inspiring and as insightful as I did. If you do enjoy this episode, please donate if you can to So Sad Ireland and to Mental Health Ireland. They are two great organisations that work hard to support and empower the mental health of people and communities all over our country. You can help support their work by going to sosadireland.ie forward slash donate or mentalhealthireland.ie forward slash donate. Before we get started, I just wanted to wish you a Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. I also wanted to remind you that So Sad Ireland is here to support you and your mental health. If you are struggling in the coming weeks, please go to sosadireland.ie to learn more or call the 24-7 support line on 1800 901 909. So sad of trained volunteers on call for emergencies 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, for anyone who may be in distress and in need of professional help and support. Stephen Lynch, you're very welcome to the Real Talks with So Sad Ireland Wellbeing series. I suppose I'll get straight to it and I'll ask you my first question is, how and why does a man living in Australia end up running from Wisenhead to Ballonhead? To raise funds for So Sad Ireland and Mental Health Ireland. Uh, it was a funny one, really. <laughs> got into running about two years ago, and by got getting into running, I mean going from five k and then end up doing a marathon. Well, like enjoy doing that, it was, and then I was kind of thinking, what can I do? What's a bit bigger? And when I was training for that, there was a guy running across the the width of Australia, and I was looking at him, and I was looking at his background, and I was thinking, he's just a normal guy, like. The, the, he's not he hasn't grown up any different or like he's just a human being and I was thinking like if he can do that surely I can do something just as good and I was playing around and I was googling a few bits and I googled the width of Ireland and I thought it's probably a bit too short and then I googled the length and I was looking at the records and stuff and I was thinking yeah I can do that and it's kind of just in my head then for about a year and a half like like let, let's just, just commit to it let's do it but uh, one thing I must say worked in my favour is the length of Ireland's a lot smaller than the width of Australia. <laughs> so cut off lightly there. When you say you committed to it, Stephen, so that was was that something that you had the thought of it and it was bouncing around your head for 18 months or did you kind of start training for it with a view that you were going to do that down the line? Like, tell us a little bit about how, I suppose, so that's how the idea came. But then how does it kind of, so we all have ideas all the time and actually it becoming a real thing. Like, tell me a little bit about that kind of part of the journey. Well, one thing I'll, I'll say first is that I always say there's two types of people in the world. People who talk about doing things and people who do things. Big difference. Uh, but I, I remember it was like lockdown. It was, I think it was 2021. We had a bit of a lockdown here in Sydney and all the gyms were closed. So me and a few lads just started doing five and 10 Ks. And one of the boys walked into me on lunch and he says... Oh, Stephen, you fancy doing this marathon? And I was like, when is it? And he said, 11 weeks. I was like, oh, kind of thinking, all right, go on. Let, let, let's go for it. So I signed up. Uh, me, my roommate, and another fella, we started training for it. 11 weeks later, we did it. Absolutely loved it. And then it was kind of like, what can I do? That was just before Christmas. What can I do what's more than a marathon? And I was like, I'll do, I'll do an ultra marathon. So the, the following May, did my first ultra marathon. And then kind of since I've done that, which was 60 kilometers, I was thinking, I can definitely do this. Like if you put enough time and you're consistent with your training, like you, you can definitely keep going. So did another ultra marathon, which was 80K, which went really well. And I finished really high up in, in the rankings, but end up getting like short term liver failure for a couple of days. Uh, so I ended up in hospital then for a day or two. My mom went mental over that. And then when I was in the hospital, I think I sent her a WhatsApp message just off the, the Google length of Ireland. And she just basically said, F- off, like. And <laughs> that, that was in November. And as soon as I did that 80 kilometer, I knew, I was like, right, I'm going to do this. So in January, I started putting out there, like, this is what I'm going to do this year. I'm going to come home in August. I'm going to do tip to top of bottom, top of Ireland to the bottom. 
And yeah, since I put it out on social media, and like I knew that was it, I committed to it. I have a planner which I use every day and wrote at the start of it in January, like things I wanted to do this year. One was run the length of the Ireland and raise 50,000 for charity, and then roll on August, and we got there. Mm. Oh, it's, no, it's absolutely class. Like it's such a, it's such an incredible story. Like it's such an inspiring story. And then, like I suppose, before I come to like the actual run itself and doing that, because I think basically you ran probably what five hundred. I think it was five hundred and fifty k. Was it five sixty three? So uh, five sixty. Yeah, I'm, I'm, and I'm sure the last thirty nine didn't count for so <laughs> <laughs> it was meant to be 550 but I think we went wrong a few ways right um, so to take on that like so you do 550k and I know you said there you set a target of 50,000 which you already cleared like at, at any point during that kind of build up in that window are you like ah jays and like could I duck out of this or should I do this or I suppose I'm curious about well, you said you put out on social media like was that to help keep yourself accountable and kind of put that out there to like make sure you get it done no, there's, to be honest, like my network of friends here in Australia are all into training and they're all competitive and we kind of spur each other on in that way. Like someone's always doing something, someone's running a marathon or someone's doing an Ironman or well, whatever it is. And when I put it out there and it was out there for a couple of weeks, months, and the way no one ever questioned me mm. or said, no one's doubted me or no one said, oh, Stephen, you sure you want to do this or... Stephen, I don't think that's possible. And I think being in that bubble over here and not having anyone like put any sort of doubt in my mind or, or say, Stephen, are you sure this is the right thing and for whatever the case might be. And I think that kind of kept me in a, the right headspace all the time. But then my roommate actually went home for three weeks. Uh, I think it was around April, May time. And he's back in the local pub. And one of the boys said to him, how oh, do you think Stephen's going to do this? And my roommate Adam says, "Have you have you have you met Stephen? He's the most stubborn person you ever met." And he goes, "Ah, oh, no, the, the human body can't do that." And he came back and he told hmm. me and that that was just in my head the whole time. I was like, "I'm gonna f- show you." <laughs> <laughs> but there was that, but that was the only bit of say negative, like negative kind of feedback that I got, which I really needed as well. Hmm. It really kicked me on as well. But uh, yeah, no one. No one doubted me at all in the slightest. Brilliant. And I'm sure there was people saying, maybe back home or whatever it is, oh, he can't do that. Because I wasn't around it or I had to hear any of it, it's kind of like, well, yeah, like, why can't I do this? Yeah. And in, in some ways, like, because you are preparing, like, you're preparing in Australia to do the run in Ireland, like, you're kind of in your own bubble as well in terms of, like, it's just a, a kind of a self journey for training and getting ready to do it. Um, and then obviously, as you said there, like being, the importance of being surrounded by good people who are encouraging and are building confidence in you and like supporting you. Um, the other thing I was going to ask you on, like on that side of it was like, I think you touched upon it earlier. I definitely read something over the last couple of weeks. Like you're, it's not like you weren't like a runner from the time you were a kid and just mad into running and push yourself. You kind of stumble into this kind of later in life, right? Oh, well, when I was a kid, I was actually severely overweight up until maybe it was about 11 or 12. My mom had to stop buying bread when I was a kid because she's afraid of me getting bullied in secondary school. So, but I love sport. Always love sport. Like I played uh, football in Gaelic like my whole life. Played it, well, I would say, if half, like a half decent standard. I played Drawler, Shelburne. Played Gaelic then with, with the league until about minor. So I was always really active and obviously all that weight I lost when I was a teenager. But I was never like a runner. Mm. Like a, I wouldn't say I'm quick. I'd say I'm I'm stubborn and it can very consistent, which long distance running definitely suits me. But yeah, let's see. Went from uh, from doing like a five or ten k to doing a marathon within eleven weeks. And the the best part about that story is, like my my roommate came in and said, "Do you fancy doing this in eleven weeks?" And I was like, "Yeah, why not?" And then within an hour, we had another mate jump on board. Like, I don't think if I was at home in Ireland that I'd have someone just say to me, Stephen, do you fancy doing this in 11 mm. weeks? And within an hour, I'd have someone else keen to do it. So I think having that sort of, that, like the surroundings of people who are like active and want to push themselves definitely helped me when it came to doing this. Yeah, I think that's such an important point because, you know, especially like, 
from the mental health side of it, people will often say, you know, be active or exercise and it's beneficial for your mental health. And we all kind of like, that's commonly accepted and we understand that. But like a lot of the time, the thing that puts someone off trying something new is the fact that it's new or that they haven't done it before. Um, and what it sounds like, even just as I listened to your journey there, well, yes, there's a background in sport, but like you started off with your 5K to a 10K to and built it up. Or likewise, someone might start with a 1K or a lap of the track and build it up slowly and kind of, I suppose, did you find confidence and resilience building in yourself as you kind of stuck to and kept kind of chipping away at the train inside of it? Well, to be honest, like, I got... I feel like no matter what you do, no matter what distance you run or what speed you run, someone's always doing more and someone's always doing it quicker. So when people say like, oh, Stephen, you ran a marathon or you've done this, like I've done all of this in just short of two years, which isn't a long time and when, when you think about it. But like we all have to start somewhere, whether that's a 1K, whether that's 100 metres. Once you want to go further the next time and you, you put the right program in place, like, I've had like I, one thing I must say we we had a running coach for the last two years. We we paid weekly and he would do our program for the week and work it around your schedule and he would then give you a feedback every week on like an online video. And just paying that was only like thirty dollars a week and having that accountability and someone to check in with was massive when it came from going from ten k to Martin to sixty k eighty k to doing the, the length of Ireland. And I think there are things that are severely, people don't realize that having that like accountability person is, is a massive factor because if you have no one to check in with, with, with each week, it's like a teacher not having to show your homework set. You're not going to do it. No, I think that again, there's such like, there's such important learning there in terms of you know, I think you found like having training buddies, having accountability through a coach, um, setting yourself targets. Like it's, it, it all kind of, it sounds like it came together like in a nice way for you. And then to actually like, I suppose to go through that journey, the, the development, the progression, Stephen, to then talk to me a little bit about, okay, so you get home to Ireland in August and it's like, right, I'm, I'm doing this. Um, so tell us a little bit about kind of the build up to it, maybe the few days before and, where you're at mentally, I suppose, as you start it first. Let's start there. Well, just to go back, and it's one thing I think is massive, is that no one kind of understands the amount of work you put in beforehand. Like, I was getting up every morning at like five o'clock. I was like going to the gym to do strength work on my lunch and going back to do foam rolling and do stretching. And then after work and going for like, I don't know, 15, 20 Ks on like a Monday. And then I'm doing the same again on a Tuesday. And it's, they're the things that people don't see. Mm-hmm. Whereas like people think, oh, it's all well and good. He, he has all his time in his hand. It's like, I work full time. I'm not an athlete. And like, I have to do all this around my 40 hour week. And I think there are things that people, especially from home, might have seen. Whereas like, I spent the first eight months of this year living like a monk, if that makes sense. But just to go back to the build up, like I, I landed back in Ireland and I suppose I didn't really have too much time to think about it because landing back on it, I think it was a Wednesday or Thursday. That Saturday I had my niece's christening. So that kind of, it kind of took away that. Well, I think coming home and just the buzz of seeing everyone because I have a few nieces and nephews. So I didn't really have time to really think too much about the run. And I think that helped me massively not overthink the run, but then I think it might have let myself down during the run as well in some aspects. But the Saturday is Nice's Christmas, Sunday then the camper the camper van comes into the house and then it's like, right, it's getting real now. <laughs> We're about to set off now at two or three o'clock or whatever it was. And I suppose I, I wasn't nervous or I didn't think, like I said, I didn't think too much about it because I feel like you can overcomplicate and overdress everything. But when in, in hindsight, all I have to worry about is getting from A to B. And it's just do one kilometer, do two kilometers. Is anyone even starting off running? Like, you have to start somewhere. So I just started by saying, right, this is where I have to start today. This is where I have to finish. And my biggest concern was just trying to get the right kind of food and sleep into me. Because, uh, I, I, like, sleep is, is probably the, the biggest things in terms of recovery. And it's something what definitely got affected for the, the eight days on the road. 
But uh, no, honestly, when it came to the build up, I think we're having so many distractions. Nothing really kind of entered my head as, whoa, I'm actually going to do this until the Sunday when we took off. Yeah, so then, and you said you got in, you, when you flew in, you got you went straight home. So just for anyone listening that's not sure, home is Dulik, you said to me, right? <laughs> Dulik is a, a small village between Nav and Andrade. And it's definitely, it's it's County Mead. I'd never say him aloud, man. Uh, but uh, no, yeah, Dulik, and I must say, it's probably the best village in, I'd say, the world. Easy for, like, getting behind each other and support. Like, the support I had from everyone. It was the most overwhelming experience I've ever had in my life, honestly. In what way? Because I I'm doing this like run, and like all I'm concerned about is doing the run, and I'm trying to stay on top of social media and stuff like that. And I'm thinking like, who's actually? No one's gonna watch this. Like they might check in every now and again. And then my sisters came down on the second day, and they're like, Stephen, you need to keep putting stuff up. Like everyone at home is 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 watching this every every second. And, like, my messages are getting hammered, but I'm thinking, I'm still not thinking, because I'd never think myself too highly that people are going to take time out of their day to, to watch what I'm doing. But I really caught on, and my sisters then took over to Facebook. And the support was just, it was crazy. I couldn't believe it. And just, that's just people, like, was it, like, comments and people reaching out and, like, share and stuff, and, like, or, like, were people helping practically that as well? Kind of, how was that all working for you? Well, I was getting messages all the time, just mm. and like I was trying to stay on top of them, but I got to the point where I, I just couldn't. It's just because I was so concerned about trying to cover the mileage and trying to rest. But my sisters took over, and I remember at night, like I'd be lying in bed, and I might have ten minutes before I have to try and turn the lights off, or I might have my feet in ice, and I might be able to scroll through a few bits, and just seeing all the comments go down, like on Facebook and Instagram, because I used to put up a post every day of like an update, and it, I couldn't believe it, and. It was, it was the best feeling in the world, honestly. And then I remember after the run, about a week after, I actually just, I, I remember just one night, I just went through every single one of them. I was thinking, whoa. Yeah, I mean, it must have been, it must have been a very like powerful and like I'm sure the experience as a whole was also emotional as well. Like obviously there's the physical side of it, the mental side of it. It's going to, no doubt, the emotional side of it. And like, as we kind of maybe try to navigate through that whole journey, so tell me a little bit about kind of where did you officially start the run? Like where does that, like, and where were you at mentally as you kind of, you know, hit the road for the first time to kind of start this off? Well, so obviously get up to, I can't even remember. I started, sorry, I started at Malin in Donegal. I'm thinking, where the f*** are we? <laughs> and I, I'm at the top because the day before, like the Sunday night we went up and we just seen where we'd be starting. And I remember just looking out at like the ocean and thinking, like I'm at the very top of Ireland mm. and I went down to some B&B because I got my mum and dad to stay in a B&B and I stayed in the camper and I was just I felt quite quite relaxed like I wasn't overthinking it I just wanted to make sure I got enough food into me and then the Monday morning when I was taking off I was just kind of like okay well here we go and like I said I didn't think too much into it and it, that helped me massively but then I should have done more research in terms of the route and the elevation and stuff like that because I kind of let myself down mm-hmm. halfway through the run. Because, like, the first day uh, I cleared 100 kilometers, first time ever running 100K, and, like, I had my ups and downs throughout the day, but, like, I, I felt reasonably okay afterwards. Uh, actually, I, I did 101. I don't know why. I think I was just trying to prove a point to myself. <laughs> and then I remember after that, I was like, well, here we go. Like, can we do it again tomorrow? That was the first question I asked myself when I finished the first day. Roll on to the second day and started off second day. And I remember a woman rang me from where I'm from. And I, I'm about 20 or 30 kilometers in at this point. And she's telling me this story about her son who went to do, uh, it was climb. What's that mountain in Africa? People climb. Um, which <laughs> Or it's in Tanzania. I can't think of it now. Tanzania. Okay, no, um, can we can make a fool of myself here? Kilimanjaro or yeah, no, no, it's, uh, no, and it's Kilimanjaro. Mount Kilimanjaro. Okay, and she's, she's me, telling me geography I, teacher. She's listening to this. Be like, great. <laughs> I don't, I don't know how because I know it myself and I just hit a blank. But anyway, this woman rings me from where I'm from, and she she's telling me about her son who's climbing Kilimanjaro, 
and he's doing it on his honeymoon with his wife on his honeymoon and they get their 400 meters from the top and his wife becomes sick with altitude sickness and he ended up never finishing it and going back down with her because she was ill and she kind of said look Stephen no matter what you do you, you need to finish this like and she told me that story and I was thinking, she, she's completely right. Like, no matter what, like, I'm going to do this. So the second day, did another 100 kilometers. And I felt reasonably okay again. Again, biggest concern is just trying to get food, sleep into me. And then the third day is when things started to, to crumble a bit. <laughs> so <laughs> I wouldn't say crumble, but I think did a few factors, but one thing I would say, over those two days, I did over a thousand meters elevation gain in both days, mm. which is a thousand meters elevation gain. That's bigger than the largest mountain in England. So for the first two days, I would have done that twice. Right. But come the third day, I was definitely feeling it. And I remember third day in, I'm about, I think I'm about 15, 20 Ks in. And uh, my girlfriend pulls up in, in the car and she next it jumps out one of my friends from Australia who's at home from, at the same time and he's kid out in the running gear and he's going to come with me so it, that definitely picked me up so went from about 20 then to about 63 and I, I was feeling like my ankles honestly felt like class and I remember saying like if anyone get me a physio I wouldn't mind getting them to to try and give me a rub or trying to just do something to kind of give me a bit of extra support so seeing a physio at 63 kilometers in, and I remember lying on this physio bench on the side of the road in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and uh, he's trying it's to... The glamorous touch. stuff, isn't it? <laughs> it's definitely not glamorous. But uh, I had yeah, someone trying to feed me pizza as well, which I couldn't even stomach at the time. But uh, I'll never forget, he was trying to, like, because my quads were that smashed from the two days of elevation. He couldn't even touch them without them going in a spasm. Mm. And then my ankle set like glass and he, he says, oh, I can tape them up, which I thought as a I thought at the time was a really good idea. But I don't know if he taped them up too quick or I just my ankles took a bad reaction to the tape. Cause it went from 63, finished at 80 then for the day. And I remember like taking off this tape and my legs just blew up massively. Like my ankles were the size of my calves. Like it was literally, it was crazy. I remember lying in bed and we're in Tullamore at the time. I'm not Tullamore, we're in Offaly at the time. And I had my feet up on these pillows. My feet are swollen to pieces. Like they are in tatters. Like my face is a bit swollen because I think I got a bit of sunstroke as well. It was quite sun sunny. And I, I literally, I couldn't move. And mum was like, my mum and my sister was like, Stephen, you can't like keep doing this. I was like, well, why can't I? And they're like, well, you can't even move. I'm like like let's not worry about it a man was like will you will you just like see someone or, or do something i said look i'll book into a physio in the morning i'll get him to ha have a quick assessment of me and we'll go from there and during this time my sister rang a and e for an ambulance to come but never Did you, you didn't me. know about right not a clue so i'm lying in bed it's one o'clock in the morning and these three paramedics come into the room and I, I'm like, my head's gone. Cause I'm thinking mm. all I want to do is sleep. I'm absolutely knackered. And they're, they're taking a look at me and they're asking bits and pieces. And I'm like, well, look, I'm, I'm booked into physio in the morning. I'll go from there. And the three of them leave. And then they come back again. And they're like, well, Stephen, you're actually really bad. Like your, your feet are absolutely swollen to pieces. Like you have sunstroke, you're dehydrated. Like you, you need to come with us and we need to get you on a drip. And I was like, well, I, I'm not going to go. And then I honestly felt like they're on commission for bringing me in. It was crazy. And I remember them saying, well, look, you could get a blood clot and you, you could die and all this sort of bits and pieces. And I was like, all right, well, well, will I get seen to quickly? And they're like, yeah, we'll get you seen to within an hour. And I was like, right, okay, I'll go. And I was like, but I can't move. You're going to have to get me like a stretcher or whatever it is. And they're like, oh, we'll go get them. And then they left the room, and I remember thinking, if I go, that's it, the run's over. So it's like, no, f that. So I told my girlfriend, Gemma, to, to go out and tell him that. <laughs> it was a bit of a Wolf of Wall Street moment. It's like, I'm not fucking leaving. <laughs> and uh, she went out and told him, look, he's not going. 
And they came back again. They're like, Stephen, you have to come. I said, listen, I'm not going. I'll fizz you in the morning. I'm going to go from there. And <laughs> they left. And they, were, they weren't very happy. And I remember one of them saying, he's like, your race is over. He's like, you're, you're not getting there. And I was thinking, like, F- you. Now, I didn't say that, but that's exactly what I was thinking at the time. And he left and they left anyway. And I got back to sleep. And, and I remember I was that bad. I couldn't even go to the toilet during the night. I had to like roll over and go to like go in this like like milk bottle at the time. Mm-hmm. And then it would have to be just poured into the toilet because I couldn't move. Then in the morning, I'm like, right, I'm booked in to see this physio. Again, I can't get out of bed. So I'm rolling out of bed and I'm hobbling to go towards the car. And the physio said the night before, look, if he can't walk down the 500 meters to see me, chances are he's not going to be able to run. So I remember trying to walk out to the hotel and I was like, I can't do this. Like I'm smashed to pieces. And we got, you know, like a, it's like a dolly where you put your luggage on. Yeah. Got one of them and I, I got put in one of them and they rolled me to the car. <laughs> I get I get into the, the passenger seat and we drive down to this physio and he comes out and he comes he comes out to assess me because I can't get out of the car <laughs> to go into him. And he, he starts like feeling my legs and asks me a few questions and he says, Listen, get them elevated, get some ice on them. You should be able to walk come after lunchtime. And I'm thinking, right, that's it, game on, here we are, good to go. My mother's head's gone, she can't believe it. She saw it, that's it, it's done and it's dead and buried. And once he gave me that little glimmer of hope, I was like, right, grand, right, let's get this show on the road. So went in, got my feet, like, dressed, because it's like someone took a hacksaw to them, how bad they were smashed up. So went to a chemist who were absolutely m- most most nicest chemist and staff I've ever came across. They dressed on my feet. Uh, the person who owned it, he actually did the route a few times on a, uh, on a bike, he gave me some like paracetamols and different painkillers and anti-inflammatories. And I was like, listen, everyone, like no one's still saying you can't do this. Far from my mom and my sisters who are just concerned for my health. So I'm like, right, let's just like crack on. So that day, I think I walked like 14, 15 kilometers and that was like the day off. And then woke up in the morning. I had a couple of my cousins land down and that was it. Like, like in terms of mobility wise, I couldn't really move. Like, I was walking, I was jogging, I was walking, I was jogging. And, like, I just knew from there on in, no matter what, like, this thing has to be done. So I ended up doing 60 kilometers then the following day. And then the day after, I think I did, like, 50. And I was kind of just chipping away in 50, 60 kilometer blocks each day after that. And I'll never forget, like, like, I'm spending 14, 15 hours on my feet. And I'm thinking, like, 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 I... I just don't understand how I can physically keep going because I'm like pushed to my absolute limit. Like I wouldn't say I cried in about 10 years. Mm. Like I remember crying to myself so many times straight those like eight, eight and a half, nine days, whatever they were. Like, and what's going through your mind in those, like, those spells of like, obviously when you feel like that emotion, Stephen, and I got, I'm presuming you're in quite significant physical pain also. What's going through your head in terms of like, you've all, you've already had those moments where, you know, people have suggested stopping or kind of that, that opportunity kind of pops up to, Hey, the doctor's here or the ambulance is here and they're telling me I can't go. So here's me out. Like, I suppose one, what keeps yeah. you going in those moments? And then two, like emotionally kind of what's going on in, in well, those moments, more, if that makes sense. It's more so, so that the, I think the fourth, fifth and sixth day, like I had, I had people with me the whole time. So like I had so much support who come down and stuff. And, like, I never kind of got a chance to really just kind of, like, have a good, like, cry or a good scream. And I remember on the Sunday, like, people were obviously going back. And I remember the Sunday, I remember getting into the, the camper. It was, like, 40 kilometers. And, like, I'm in a pretty bad way. And my uncle at the time says, look, you only have another five in you. Like, we, we need to get you home. And I was kind of just thinking, I said, I told everyone, I said, listen, just let me stick my headphones in. I'm going out there by myself. And that's it. Like, mm. I'm gone. And I remember my dad trying to, to walk with me because he didn't want me going by myself. And there's this scene in, in Rocky Four where he's training out in the snow and he has, like, the chauffeurs who are following him all the time. And he basically just takes off and they can't keep up with him. 
And I remember my dad just trying to keep up with me. And I was like, listen, I'm getting out of here. And like, like I felt like I was absolutely belting it because I started to really kind of pick up a, a steady jog. Now, it wasn't going that fast, but in my head, I was thinking, like, I'm flying here. And I remember it started to rain. The sun was gone. I started to rain. It started to get dark. I had music in my head. And I remember I was cr- like, I was on this like main road and I just remember crying to myself. I remember shouting to myself, screaming and smash out 15 kilometers. And I remember I was finishing the 15 kilometers. And it's like, for I was like that hour and a half, two hours, whatever it was, I felt like the biggest hair session of my life. <laughs> I remember just finishing up and uh, getting into the camper. And my uncle said to me, he says, Stephen, if I had to go to war tomorrow, <laughs> you'd be the first person I'd call. <laughs> and I remember just having those 15 kilometers just to really push myself because it felt too comfortable for those three days because I had people around me, had all this support. And I was like, this is not supposed to be comfortable. This is meant to be me pushing myself to my absolute limit. And when I got out there and I was in the rain and I was really hammering it out, and I, like, I was in a lot of pain and I'm screaming and crying. I was like, this is what it's supposed to be like. And I finished that night and I had this like, it's like this like moment of clarity where it's like, it's n- no matter what pain you're in, no matter what you feel, no matter like what happens, you can still keep going. And that, that, that to me was the message that I wanted to get across regardless. Yeah, it's, it's extremely powerful, Stephen, in the sense of, I suppose, just even listening to you talking there of needing that time to yourself to like experience it and to fully feel what you're feeling. Um, and I suppose I, I would hope that in the middle of all that, you found kind of a flow state and there was a bit of escapism from it as well. I don't know if there was or if it was it was an intense oh, experience. No, I, w- I wouldn't say that, but I do know what you mean by flow and escapism. And I think there are things that are massively underlooked us as a society massively especially back home in ireland is no one has that release from everyday life and i feel like that's where people go wrong people don't play a sport or have a hobby or a pastime where they don't get out and get that hour of escape where they don't think about anything other than being there like i always think of the, the people always say you can't stop thinking like your mind can never switch off but i always think when you're you're playing a sport and the football's at your feet like, you don't actually think about anything other than what am I going to do with this ball? And I think that's such a powerful thing where you can, let's see, everything that's going on in your life for that second or second with a ball at your feet can just disappear. And I think people underestimate or people don't think how powerful that can be to do that and to have that hour, hour to themselves a couple of times a week. Now, with regard to that 15 kilometers, no, I wouldn't say it was a flow state or an escape. Mm. I think it was just me just really wanting to feel every aspect of what I was putting myself through. And I loved it. Mm. Like, it was the best feeling in the world when I like finished up. And I remember giving my dad and my uncle a hug. And I was thinking, right, we're going to do this, do you know? And that, it sounds like that stretch, Stephen, like was that, that was one of those real like tipping points where you're really, I suppose, proving something to yourself and then kind of where the f- does the finish line start becoming like a realistic thing again or you get a sense of that, I'm, go- like, I'm, I'm going to get there. Well, look, that was a Sunday night and I remember thinking that we had 90 kilometers left then. Mm-hmm. And, well, we thought 90 kilometers was a bit longer. Uh, and I remember thinking then the Monday, oh, the Monday morning then, I was so happy like taking off. I was like, right, we're going to do this. But then... Like in hindsight, I was really happy taking off. But then because I'm that battered, I'm cl- covering such little ground. I'm like, the only way I'm going to get there is just by spending so much time on my feet. And no matter how quick I wanted to go on that Monday, like I couldn't go. Like I remember getting to, I don't know, if it's, I can't even think of the name of the town. It's about 40 odd kilometers out from the finish anyway. And I remember sitting on the curb on the, on the ground and I, I was like, I had to be picked up because I couldn't move my legs. They're just absolutely smashed. And I think having that come down from the Sunday night and realizing that, look, we still have to, we still have a bit to go. And getting through that Monday, that Monday was, like, was probably the hardest day. 
because no matter how quick I wanted to go and how close I was to the finish, I still had to just spend so much time on my feet, which was so which was so tough. Like I had to use walking poles for so for for the second half of the race mm-hmm. or the run or whatever, and like it was just it was so all destroying knowing how close it was and how slow I was going. But then roll on the last day, and I'll never forget it. The Tuesday morning. I woke up in the morning and oh, I was starting at six. My mum thought I was starting at seven. And I went out to leave it in the morning at six and she's outside having a cigarette. And she's like, Stephen, what are you doing? I was like, well, I'm, I'm starting. And she says, well, you're just not going to tell us. I was like, no, I'm sorry. I thought you knew I was going at six. And I remember looking at me and I was looking at her. And I just gave her a hug and started bawling in her arms. And I was just crying saying, I just want this to be over. Like, I literally felt like I was gone to war for eight days, which is, look, I'm sure it was nothing what most people experience in war, but that's physically what I felt like I was going through. And I remember my first kilometre on the last day. It took me 20 minutes, which is slow. And I think in, in that first kilometre period, I was kind of just speaking to myself and having a word with myself. I was thinking, All right, Stephen, let's just get the thing done. And I started then to get a slow jog on and a slow trot on. And I was jogging, I was walking, I was jogging and walking. And I remember getting the 12Ks in, having a bit of breakfast, and they were like, you're going quick enough, Stephen. Like, that's much quicker than the last few days. I was like, listen, I just want this to be over. So I started to crack on again, and I really started to loosen up and start to get a bit of a trot on. Now, like, I'm running and limping at the same time. It's ridiculous. And I remember just, I was just, I was completely just, it was like I was just so focused. I was so in the zone. I didn't even notice that my brother, my cousin, and my uncle were dragging behind me for the last, like, 15 kilometers. And I remember getting to, to 30K and meet my sisters. And I stopped the 30 kilometers, and I just had another little cry to myself. I was getting into the camper to get a robe and get some food. And I remember my sister looking at me crying, and I think that, like, broke her heart a bit. <laughs> and I was like, listen, we're, we're, we're going to do this. We're going to get there. And, like, from then on in, like, I thought it was only 9K left. It ended up being 12 or 13, but it, it that didn't even bother me a phase at the time. I was just having that, the realisation that I was coming to an end was just, it was completely surreal. And it's like I just couldn't wait for it to be over. And I remember getting to about four kilometres from the finish, and I remember saying, look, I want to do this for myself. My brother and my two cousins and that, they jumped in the camp and they're all waiting for me at the finish. And I remember like just having just having music on in my head and like I'm really like I've gone from twenty minute kilometer to like a six, six and a half minute kilometer, which is like six and a half is still reasonably it's not quick. But from where I started in the day to where it's finishing, I was like, how the f am I doing this? But it's like something just kind of took over. And I think I think no matter how hard or how like how hard things are or you still always have more in you. And I remember I remember hearing something about the 40% rule. It's like, no matter how, how f***ed you are, apparently when you can't go anymore, you're only at 40%. And, like, I remember that last day and just thinking, like, there's still more in the tank. And I, I finished it, and I'll never forget the feeling of just falling to the ground afterwards and thinking. Like, it wasn't like this, like, like this big overwhelming feeling of like, of like, I've just achieved this. It was more or less just like, thank God it's over. Mm-hmm. Because I went on, I wanted to do it in like five or six days, did it in eight and a half. So it dragged on a bit longer than I would have liked. But like I had my sisters there, I had my brother, uh, like I had my cousins and stuff there at the finish. And it was just unbelievable the just the relief of knowing that I didn't have to go anymore. <laughs> I can I can only imagine the sense of relief that that came from that, you know, that I've gone through, as you said, time wise, like it took like you basically find yourself on the road for an extra couple of days. So even like just the mental drain of that, the physical demand of that. Um you've mentioned there like the emotional side of like crying multiple times throughout it. Like you obviously must have been like it look, it was like a real emotional roller coaster, just a full on roller coaster of an experience. And I suppose I'm curious now that maybe a couple of months on past it, Stephen, how you kind of reflect back on it as a whole now, where it, where it's somewhat in the rearview mirror, you know, and you can kind of look back at it. How do you reflect on it? 
Well, just going back to that roller coaster comment, I think it's funny because on the first day of the morning, my coach texts me saying, look, strap yourself in. because Buckle this up, sunshine. Of, yeah, <laughs> yeah, this could be one hell of a ride. And I was thinking, no, I did, at that point, I didn't have a clue what I was going to put mm. myself through. But yeah, roll on a couple of months. And I think the best thing for me was that I could leave uh, home and come back here to Australia. And like, I don't have to, like, I don't talk about it ever. To be honest, and it's just probably, it's, it's not a good thing is that I don't actually give myself the recognition for doing something like that. Because uh, I've just kind of came back into normal life. I started a new job when I came back. And I've just started cracking on with life again where I left off. It's kind of like, like I still don't feel like I've done this big, massive thing. Where in hindsight, I definitely should. But I don't want that to be the only thing that I'm known for. Or like, not that I'm known for anything. But I don't want to be that, to be the only thing I'm proud of. Like, I, like the biggest thing for me is that mom and dad can say, like, their son did the length of Ireland. Like, that to me is the best feeling in the world. But in terms of how I personally feel about it, I don't really think about it too much, to be honest. Because uh, I don't want to... Like, I, I'm not a person who likes to toot my own horn or say, oh, I've done this or done that. Where I'm kind of more focused, like, right, it's done now. Like, what's next? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I totally understand that. And that's like, you know, like, a lot of it is kind of the next ball mentality and stuff that we're often taught as kids or if you're if you're playing in sports or whatever it is. But I also do think it's important that, like, when in any walk of life, when you, like, spend so long, like, preparing for something and then you go and perform and do it and complete, like, it is, I do think it's important in terms of the reflection piece. And listen, that might happen in a couple of months down the line, too. It doesn't have to necessarily, um, like, it doesn't always have to happen straight afterwards. But just being able to look back on it and definitely being proud of it, you know, just listen to you there, what you pushed yourself true and um, what you accomplished like it's an incredible achievement i feel like very blessed and privileged to have been given just the insight to your own psyche and your own experience and with that in mind like i'm curious like okay so get you jump back into life and kind of the show goes on i totally understand all that but if i was to push it in terms of you're looking back like what did it what did it teach you about yourself that you didn't expect like what did you find out about from doing this that you kind of didn't expect to pop up or expect to learn well, it's not that I didn't expect, because one thing I've always been kind of used to is that kind of getting out of my comfort zone and doing things that I don't want to do. Like, I don't enjoy running. It's not as if I can't. Like, I do sometimes, and it's a lot of times where I'm like, I don't want to do this. But I think doing things you don't want to do on a regular basis is really important. Like, I remember working on a banana farm and getting up and thinking, like, this like I'm in the middle of the tropics in Australia it's lashing rain it's also about 30 degrees and I'm getting this like this fella with a machete chopping a bunch of bananas that land on my shoulders and I'm thinking like I don't want to do this but I have to do it or I just kind of always think back at times where and I think going away from home and leaving home and kind of putting your whole life in a suitcase is that you're back to the wall so many different times I like I'm sure you've had it going to New York where you're thinking like like, what the f*** am I after doing? Like, I've had it so comfortable at home, but I think it's good to be uncomfortable. And I think throughout the doing the run, no matter how hard I was pushed or how horrible I felt, like, I always knew that I could keep going. And I think we don't do things that test us nowhere near as much as we probably should. I, I remember reading somewhere, it's like, in today's world, everyone has the best of everything, but there's more people unhappy now than there ever was. And I feel like, I think it's good to do stuff you don't want to do. It's good to push yourself. It's good to go for that five kilometer when it's raining outside and you don't want to do it. Because when times do really get hard, you can look back on the times where you've been here before, when your back's been at the wall before. And I think having that of leaving home the last couple of years and doing some, like I've done some shit jobs. Like I remember doing a day's fencing work and it's 50 degrees outside. It's the worst day of my life. And me and my friend, who we, who we both did, it was a cash job a few years ago in Australia. And no matter how hard our day might get now in, in like recruitment, we can always look back. But it's still better than what we had to do that mm. day's fencing. And I think having those experiences to look back on when times get tough and when times got tough during the run, it's like, listen, I've been here. Like, 
we had when we were doing the farm work in Australia, we were doing the banana work. And we had a group chat, me and a couple of the lads who are still like my network of friends now. And it could be raining on the Monday morning and we'd be all writing in and be like, listen, lads, we can get through this. Like it's 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 one day we'll get through it. And then it'd get to Wednesday and we used to have this saying saying, the week never wins. Because no matter what, you're always going to get to that Thursday and Friday. Once you get to Thursday, that's it. The week's bet. Y- you've won. And then you have the weekend. Like, you've got to. And I think just having that having that mentality and having those experience for the last couple of years, they're the things that helped me when it came to the run, where other people probably might have kept going. I'm sure a lot of people would have, but I think just, again, having that in the locker where I've been here before, I've had my back against the wall, and doing things that I don't want to do on a regular basis, it sets the, the platform to do those things. Yeah, I suppose and it's like building resilience really through like experiences and being uncomfortable and challenging yourself and like resilience is like is, is a skill that can be grown and developed. And obviously you've described it like you know, taking lessons from life that carry forward that then help you in like a challenge like this that you take that you took on. And I suppose like in terms of the run itself, Steve, and then, and like, so obviously, huge achievement. You said, I think, 536 kilometers. You were doing it in tandem or in whole, excuse me, you were doing it as part of a fundraising drive as well for Mental Health Ireland and So Sad Ireland. And I'm curious as to kind of what was the link in there? I suppose, how much did you raise and kind of why did you choose to do it on behalf of raising funds for those two organizations? Well, End up doing 70,000, which... is crazy. Congratulations, <laughs> yeah. by the way. It's just a huge achievement. <laughs> but I'd say the biggest achievement is I remember a meeting with one of the women from Mental Health Ireland and she said, Stephen, like, you've been our biggest fundraiser ever. And that's when it really hit me. I was like, whoa, I've done something really good here. But in terms of those charities and why, like I ran my first marathon for Mental Health Ireland. I ran my first ultra marathon for So Sad. And when I came to it, because I was always going to do this for charity. So I, was, I said, I'll do the two of them. So sad to locals where I'm from. I meant to help Orange. It's a bit more broader for most of Ireland. And I just think that, like I've said it a few times, I feel like we don't do enough things today that pushes outside our comfort zones. And I think, like we, we spoke about escapism and flow and stuff. And I feel like people don't do these things as much as probably they used to. Like, we are far too comfortable and we always have our phone in our hands. And, like, I remember, I don't even see, when I was at home, I don't see kids outside playing football on the street anymore. Whereas I had all that growing up, like, going outside, like, knocking for my friends, like, calling their house phones, like, playing football on the street. And, like, mental health was never talked about when I was a kid. It wasn't actually, I didn't even know what it was until I was in my early 20s and I ended up stumbling across a book and read it. And I remember then speaking to my cousin who was in sixth year and I was in my twenties at, at the time. And my cousin told me that his, his anxiety is through the roof. I remember thinking to myself, I'm like, you're in sixth year. Whoa. Like, what do you have to be anxious about? Like, I didn't even know what that word meant. And then I was kind of thinking, well, maybe people are becoming more exposed to mental health issues early on because people aren't doing things what maybe they used to do. And one thing that is that I always try to promote is that, if you're active and you're getting sleep, like there's so many things that we can do on a regular basis to stay on top of our mental health. And I feel like they're underutilized, like sleep, like exercise, sport, doing some reading, like going for a walk, getting some sunlight in before you go sit in an office all day. Like, like I feel like they're things that people are first underutilized, but I think they're underutilized because people are unaware, if that makes sense. And I think the message I wanted to get across and it's something that definitely occurred to me when I was halfway through the run, run and I, I was really feeling that. I was like, this run has now became bigger than me. It's got to the point where I now need to set an example where no matter how tough times get, you can always move forward. And and that was it, one step at a time. And that's kind of, that's what I wanted people to see from the run. Like, no matter how hard life can get or how hard anything can get that you can still keep going forward if you just keep focusing and putting one foot in front of the other yeah i just absolutely agree you know and it's like i think what you've shown there is absolutely the 
human's ability to, you know, to persevere, to be resilient, to accomplish, to achieve. Um, like you've been a huge advocate for some of the proactive things that can help our well-being. And I suppose then, yeah, just dovetailing it all together, like just as we kind of wrap up this conversation is, I suppose and one of the reasons I love, like in terms of the work for like raising funds for the likes of SoSat Ireland and Mental Health Ireland is they're obviously operating on the other end of the spectrum too for when people are in distress, if they are experiencing anxiety, if they are experiencing depression, if they are struggling with those things, that they're providing clear and helpful supports as well. And that, yes, always pushing and trying to be proactive with our well-being, look after ourselves, trying to do all as many of the right things as we can. But I think it's so important. And I think you and I both grew up in kind of pretty smallish to medium, you know, rural places in Ireland and that that the likes of so sad Ireland around to be able to give and provide support, I suppose, if someone's in need of help, but also sometimes when they're helping people deal with deal with things that have gone on in the community or dealing with like trauma or distress. And I just think that's so important. And I think it's incredible that the journey that you've been on, the accomplishments that you have done, um, A, for yourself and that story and that challenge is just amazing. But then to pass over like 70,000 euro back to charities that are helping young people, old people, everybody in between, male, female, and everybody else. Like, it's just really incredible. I think you should be really, really proud instead of A, the the adventure, Stephen, but also just that give back that those two charities can go and keep doing their good work and keep helping people. So like you'll help a lot of people indirectly as well as, you know, who came across your story and as well who's who followed your journey or inspired by. It. And I think so I know you said earlier you don't reflect on it too much, but I'm just gonna say before I sign off, it's just something you should be really proud of. No, and look, I, I really appreciate it, Alan. And look, I never thought anyone asked me to go on a podcast. So it's, this is again surreal. But look, like I, I'm buzzing. Uh, to talk about it like and look obviously thanks for having me but the only thing is now is that if i ever want to do anything for charity again it has to be bigger <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I can't. You, you can keep me posted <laughs> no no thank you mate thank you are you already thinking of something bigger i know that from already in our conversation uh, you're that type it sounds like you have a bit of that strand in you and in the next thing or i'm not saying it needs to be tomorrow or next week but have you something in mind I look, who knows? Like, like my mother would kill me first of all. But uh, no, look, the main thing for me is just to get back. Well, I, I'm back doing a bit of running now and mm. playing sport and stuff. But look, I know that down the line, I'm going to get itching. I'm going to want to do something again. Yeah, well, Keith was posted and said, um, I'll let you go there. Because no, this is like, uh, it's funny, you know, I'm, in, I'm obviously in New York here. You're in Australia. Technically, as we're talking, we're both in different days. But I think it's incredible of, you know, to be from the same kind of belt of Ireland, to have experience with, I know, you know, same towns and different organizations like SOSAD Ireland and Mental Health. It's been great to to talk to you, Stephen, to get to know you and your journey. Um, and again, I just congratulate you and just thanks so much for joining us on the Real Talks podcast. Cheers, Alan. Thank you, mate. Gent. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Real Talks podcast. Before you go, I wanted to wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year once more. I also wanted to remind you that So Sad Ireland is here to support you and your mental health. If you're struggling in the coming weeks, please go to sosadireland.ie to learn more or you can call the 24-7 support line on 1-800-901-909. That's 1-800-901-909. So Sad Ireland have trained volunteers on call for emergencies 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. So if you or anyone you know is in distress or in need of professional help and support, please call that number or once again you can go to sosadireland.ie. Thanks for listening.